On this first Sunday of Christmas, grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to welcome those of you who are members. I want to welcome those of you who are friends and family. I want to welcome those of you who are checking out, perhaps visiting this Facebook page. It's good to be together. It's good to worship together. Welcome. I hope you all had a very Merry Christmas. I hope your day was special, and I hope it was meaningful. I do have a number of announcements to share with you. Some are the familiar announcements. Continue, those of you who are members, to look for the Monday email and the Thursday email. The Thursday email specifically will contain the order of worship for the upcoming Sunday, as well as announcements, as well as prayer requests. This Thursday email would be considered the newsletter or the announcements within the order of worship. So look for that Thursday email. Look for the Monday email, which is the order of worship and a recording of Sunday's service. Also know that uh, the Stewardship Committee is grateful for your continued support and um, engagement with the ministry of this congregation. So even though 2020 is coming to an end, we do encourage you to continue fulfilling your pledge. Um, you can do that by mailing it, placing it in the mailbox by the parking lot, electronic funds transfer, or um, simply just dropping it off. So anyway, continue to uh, give as you can. If you find that this is a hardship, relax and pray for this congregation. There still are a few days left for the 25 days of Christmas. We are still collecting to uh, give to agencies in need, specifically the food pantry, PAVE, and the homeless shelter. We're looking to give $2,500 as well as a grant from the mission committee of $1,000. So ideally, we hope to give 20, or excuse me, $3,500 to these agencies. All the money donated will go to those agencies. So I invite you now to find a place where you can worship. I invite you to be still. Maybe that means silence your cell phone. Maybe that means going to another room. But I invite you to enter into God's presence. And I pray that during this time, you will experience God's presence. And I pray as well, if you come searching, you'll find what you are seeking. So let us worship God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise God in the heights. Praise God, all you angels. Praise God, all you heavenly host. Let us praise the Lord. God became one of us so that we could see the face of love, hear the voice of peace, be touched by the hand of grace, know the heart of mercy. God comes to us offering us forgiveness and peace. And so I invite you to be still and I invite you to be quiet and to pray your own personal prayers of confession, your prayers of brokenness. And then I'll pray for us. So let us pray. Source of all hope, you invite us to live in the light and discover the splendor of your glory. We confess we often choose to remain in the darkness. Instead, we allow our fears and hurts to hold us hostage. Our expectations of life prevent us from seeing new and real possibilities. You offer us unconditional love, but we expect others to earn our love. Forgive us. May the new life born in the manger awaken new life in us and allow hope to dawn in the year ahead. 
Here is the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ is our light and our salvation. In him we are made new. Let us give thanks to God and be at peace with ourselves and with one another. Amen. As we come to our readings, I want you to simply listen to these readings, one from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, and one from the Gospel of Luke. Isaiah 61, 10 through 62, 3. And then I'll uh, read from the Gospel, Luke 2, 22 through 40. Will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, allow us to listen to the word which you have sp spoken. Allow us to listen to the voice of all creation. Allow us to listen even if we don't understand. And it's through Christ that we pray. Amen. And so listen to what the Spirit is saying to you from the prophet Isaiah. I surely rejoice in the Lord. My heart is joyful because of my God, because he has clothed me with clothes of victory, wrapped me in a robe of righteousness, like a bridegroom in a priestly crown, and like a bride adorned in jewelry. As the earth puts out its growth, and as a garden grows its seed, so the Lord God will grow righteousness and praise before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I won't keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I won't be still until her righteousness shines out like a light and her salvation blazes like a torch. Nations will see your righteousness, all kings your glory. You will be called a new name, which the Lord's own mouth will determine. You will be a splendid garland in the Lord's hand, a royal turban in the palm of God's hand. And so listen to what the Spirit is saying to you from the Gospel of Luke. When the time came for their ritual cleansing in accordance with the law from Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. It's written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord. They offered a sacrifice in keeping with what's stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. A man named Simeon was in Jerusalem. He was righteous and devout. He eagerly anticipated the restoration of Israel and the Holy Spirit rested on him. The Holy Spirit revealed to him that he wouldn't die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Led by the Spirit, he went into the temple area. Meanwhile, Jesus' parents brought the child to the temple so that they could do what was customary under the law. Simeon took Jesus in his arms and praised God. He said, Now, Master, let your servant go in peace according to your word, because my eyes have seen your salvation. You prepared this salvation in the presence of all peoples. It's a light for revelation to the Gentiles and a glory for your people, Israel. His father and mother were amazed by what was said about him. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this boy is a sign to be the cause of the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that generates opposition so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will peace, pierce your inmost being too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, who belonged to the tribe of Asher. She was very old. After she married, she lived with her husband for seven years. She was now an 84-year-old widow. She never left the temple area, but worshiped God with fasting and prayer night and day. She approached at that very moment and began to praise God and to speak about Jesus to everyone who is looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Mary and Joseph had completed everything required by the law of the Lord, 
they returned to their hometown Nazareth in Galilee. The child grew up and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and God's favor was on him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's gospel lesson seems perfect for the end of a year, almost any year, but perhaps especially this one. It's the story of an old man holding a baby boy in his arms and saying, now I can go. And it reminds me of nothing so much as one of those cartoons you might see that depict the outgoing year as an old man and the incoming year as a newborn baby. In fact, I saw one yesterday. It showed an old man with a wreath of holly on his head holding a baby in his arms. I thought, that's perfect for this text. Here in the Christmas season, you've got an old man who looks like Santa Claus, but he's holding this baby and gazing on it so tenderly that it could be Simeon holding the baby Jesus. And there was something about the look on his face that was perfect too, as if he could finally hand off the burden of responsibility to the next generation, because Simeon was old. Maybe not as old as Anna, but he was old enough to remember how things used to be before the Romans conquered Israel in 63 BC. I'm guessing he was in his 70s or 80s when this story took place. He would have been a young man when Pompey and his army laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. He would have heard the stories about how the Romans finally broke through the walls of the city and killed 12,000 Jews, and how they did what was even worse than that by desecrating the temple. Apparently, Pompey himself walked into the Holy of Holies in his muddy combat boots. No one was supposed to go in there, not any Jew, certainly not any Gentile, only the high priest, and then only once a year on the Day of Atonement. Pompey had desecrated the holiest place in Israel, and the Jews would never forget it. If I'm right, Simeon would have been a young man in those days, maybe too young to fight the Romans, but not too young to remember. In today's text, Luke says that he was one of those looking for the consolation of Israel. Consolation is defined as the comfort received after a loss. Simeon was looking for comfort. He was clinging to the promise of a Messiah, someone who would rout the Romans, set things right in Israel, and sit on the throne of his ancestor David. He himself had been promised that he would not see death before he had seen God's Messiah. And then Joseph and Mary came into the temple with their newborn son, and somehow, without any angel singing glory to God in the highest, Simeon knew that this was the one. He took the baby into his arms and said, Now, Lord, now I can die in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Simeon knew that Israel was going to be okay. Christ the Savior was born. But let me turn my thoughts toward those of you who are seeing and hearing this sermon. I just wonder if there are any Simeons or Annas in your congregation, people who can remember the good old days of the church and who may be wondering what's going to become of it. If your church has been around long enough, I'm guessing there was a time when the building was full on Sunday mornings, or nearly, because there was a time in this country back in the 50s when going to church was simply the Sunday morning thing to do. I sometimes call it the church-going boom because it coincided almost exactly with the baby boom between 1946 and 1964. The war was over. Soldiers and sailors came home and married their high school sweethearts. They moved into houses with white picket fences and began to have babies, lots of babies. Those parents wanted their babies to grow up in the church just as they had, 
They came by the hundreds, by the thousands, and soon churches were scrambling to find enough nursery space and then enough Sunday school space for all those babies, all those children. And because their parents were coming to church too, they needed bigger sanctuaries. They built them or added additional services, and for a little while at least, those sanctuaries were full, or nearly. And then for a number of reasons, things began to change. In a book called Resident Aliens, Will Willimon suggests that things began to change not in 63 BC, but on a Sunday evening in 1963. He writes, then, in Greenville, South Carolina, in defiance of the state's time-honored blue laws, the Fox Theater opened on Sunday. Seven of us, regular attenders of the Methodist Youth Fellowship at Buncombe Street Church, made a pact to enter the front door of the church, be seen, then quietly slip out the back door and join John Wayne at the Fox. That evening has come to represent a watershed in the history of Christendom, South Carolina style. On that night, Greenville, South Carolina, the last pocket of resistance to secularity in the Western world, served notice that it would no longer be a prop for the church. There would be no more free passes, no more free rides. Willimon says that while it may seem trivial to date the collapse of Christendom to that Sunday evening in 1963, he would also say that before that night he didn't have a choice between going to church and going to the movies. The church was the only show in town. On Sundays, the town closed down. He writes, you couldn't even buy a gallon of gas. The most exciting thing that happened all day was the traffic jam when everybody was trying to get to their respective Sunday schools. Some of you can probably remember when things were like that in your town. But they are not that way anymore, are they? And you have to wonder, what happened? Maybe Willimon is right. Maybe it's because the Fox Theater opened on a Sunday night. Or maybe it's because everything started opening on Sundays, bowling alleys and grocery stores and shopping malls. Maybe it's because the baby boom eventually came to an end, or because so many of those babies grew up and went off to fight in Vietnam. Maybe it's because inventions like air conditioning and television made it a little too easy to just stay at home on Sunday mornings. Or maybe those people are right, who say it's because we took God out of the public schools, although I don't think so. Whatever the reasons, the cultural forces that used to push people through the front doors of the church, began to pull them back out again. And we entered a period that I've been calling the Great Panic, that time in the late 60s and early 70s, when sanctuaries began to empty out as if somebody had pulled the plug in the bathtub. And church leaders began to wring their hands, wondering what was wrong and how they might fix it. It was about this time that a couple of youth ministers from Chicago decided to start a new church. And they started by doing a survey, by going around and asking people why they weren't coming to church anymore. The people said the music was outdated, the sermons weren't relevant, and they didn't like to dress up on Sundays. So Bill Hybels and Dave Holmbo started a church called Willow Creek that met in a theater, where people could listen to contemporary Christian music, sermons that were edgy and relevant, dramas that brought home the central point, and best of all, they didn't have to dress up. The church was a phenomenal success. In fact, within just a few years, some 15,000 people per weekend were attending services that weren't exactly Christian worship in the way we know it, but were certainly seeker-friendly. Soon everybody was trying to emulate the success of Willow Creek. The so-called church growth movement produced community churches in almost every city, featuring contemporary worship that included live bands and singers who performed like pop stars, gifted speakers who strolled out onto the platform wearing golf shirts, who peppered their sermons with real-life illustrations, and talked about things like 
how to deal with the stresses of everyday life, and how to raise happy, healthy children. Some of these churches used drama, others used video, but all of them tried to make a break from the old way of doing church, from the hymn books and prayer books, the pipe organs and priests. And again, people responded. They began to leave their old churches and come to these new ones. Now, what some of us missed in all of this was the shift from a model in which people came to church out of duty, devotion, or habit, to a model in which we tried to make coming to church attractive to them. It's a subtle shift, but can you guess what happens when you start trying to make coming to church attractive? You start thinking about what people like and how you can give it to them. Do they like coffee and donuts? Well, let's give it to them. Do they like contemporary worship? Let's give it to them. Do they like preaching that relates to everyday life? Let's give it to them. The problem, of course, is that some churches are better at this than others. Some have more resources than others. And so a few churches in town become mega churches, while the rest simply struggle to survive. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I don't have anything against relevant preaching. I don't have anything against contemporary worship. And I certainly don't have anything against coffee and donuts. But when you make up your mind that you will do whatever it takes to get people to come to church, then you will get just the kind of church you deserve a congregation of fickle religious consumers who will leave you as soon as the church next door opens up an espresso bar. And here's the truth. Some people aren't going to come to church no matter what you do. In 1960, roughly half the U.S. population was going to church on a regular basis. By 1971, that number had dropped to 41%. In 2002, the number had dropped to 31 percent, but in 2005, a team of sociologists did the same survey, but used a different question. Instead of asking people, do you attend church regularly, they asked, did you go to church last Sunday? And this time, the percentage fell from 31 percent to 22 percent of the population. The last number I heard was 17%, but that was several years ago. I'm sure it's gone down since. I hope that by now you have plotted a mental graph, and if you have, you can see that if things continue for the next 50 years, as they have for the last 50 years, church going in America will drop right off the chart. In England, which seems to be 20 to 25 years ahead of us in terms of secularity, an estimated 3% of the population goes to church on Sunday. 3%. And those waves are even now washing up on our shores. Which makes me think this is a perfect time to re-examine the church's mission and purpose. One of the questions we need to ask is this. Is our mission and purpose completely wrapped up in our building? I hope not. I've been in a church that couldn't give up its big, beautiful building even when the congregation had dwindled down to almost nothing. As a consequence, every dollar they took in, every ounce of energy they expended went toward that building. It became their mission, and the neighborhood around them was neglected so they could take care of the building. And, oh, that building was beautiful. It was one of the most beautiful places I had ever worshipped. But it was like a glittering edifice built on top of a trash heap, with homeless people sleeping on the front porch and church members stepping over them to come inside and worship in that beautiful space. It makes me wonder what they were worshipping. But let me get back to Simeon. He was old, old enough to remember what Israel had been like before the Romans came, to remember what it had been like when it was free. Those were the good old days, and Simeon and others like him had been praying for deliverance ever since. 
When Joseph and Mary walked into the temple with that baby in their arms, Simeon said, Now, Lord, now I can die in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. What would it take for you to say that about your church? What kind of reassurance would you need that things are going to be okay? Is it not enough to know that God is with you? And if God is with you, all will be well? The truth is that the holiest moments in Israel's history happened while they were in the wilderness, worshiping God in a tent. The truth is that most of their sacred scriptures were written down and preserved while they were in exile in Babylon. There's really no way to know what might happen to your church in the days ahead. But I believe this. If God is with you, then, in the words of Julian of Norit, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. Let me close with a word of encouragement from my own experience. On March the 11th, 2020, I was on vacation with my wife. If she hadn't looked at her phone, I might not have known that the World Health Organization had just announced a global pandemic. I spent the next couple of days on the phone with church leaders trying to make a decision about what we should do on Sunday. And eventually, we encouraged everyone to just stay home, stay safe. Still, 92 people who hadn't gotten the word showed up. We tiptoed carefully through that service and then shooed everyone out the doors. We didn't open those doors again for seven months. Now, if you had told me beforehand that we were going to stop gathering for seven months, and that we were going to stop passing the offering plate under people's noses, I might have said we should all just quit, that there's no way a church could survive that kind of disruption. But here's the good news. We didn't quit, and we have survived. In fact, we've done better than survive. Our members have learned how to access worship on our webcast. They've gathered as couples and families, maybe invited over a close friend, and sung the hymns at the top of their lungs. They have learned how to give online. It didn't happen overnight, and there were a few anxious weeks in there, but now their gifts come in more regularly than ever. Our financial future looks to be secure. I hope you've had a similar experience at your church, but even if you haven't, I hope you have learned that the church is more than a building and that its future rests not in the weekly attendance and giving figures, but in the hands of the one Simeon met in the temple that day, Christ, the Savior. Jesus said, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. If you are ready to respond to God's call to share in our worship and our service and to follow Christ more faithfully, we welcome you. And God welcomes you. As we come to our time of prayer, know that God hears what's in your heart. God hears all our prayers, both joys and concerns. So I invite you to lift those prayers up as we pray together. God of love, as we celebrate the birth and life of Jesus, our Savior, we are filled with thanks. Our gratitude overflows in prayers for our world, the world you love. We pray for all children. Guard their minds, protect their bodies, strengthen their characters, and give them joy. Help them look to the future with hope and trust. We pray for the most aged among us. Protect them in the midst of the ongoing pandemic and reassure them of their value to you and to us, even when we cannot meet together. 
We pray for those whose hearts are filled with pain and fear. We pray for those for whom Christmas is linked with loss or grief. Surround each one with a strong sense of your comforting presence. We pray for those who do not have enough to eat and for those who lack adequate shelter in our community and in desperate corners of the world. For those who eat alone without the comfort of human contact. And for those whose hearts and lives have been broken by trauma and loss. And for those who struggle with the many costs of the pandemic. Surround each one with a strong sense of your comforting presence. We pray for family members and friends, those nearby and those we cannot meet with this year. Remind them of our steadfast love. And to any who are struggling this season, O oh God, give your gift of peace. As the year draws to a close, we surrender to you, O oh God. We surrender the challenges it has held for us so that they will not remain as burdens. Remind us of the good things that have offered us encouragement in times of isolation. We give you thanks for the people who continue to care for us and care about us. Give us courage and wisdom for the year ahead. We pray that our leaders will have wisdom and generosity of spirit for the decisions they must make on our behalf. Guide scientists working to continue to produce and to release the vaccine and support all those essential workers whose faithfulness to their responsibilities help us all cope in these difficult days. Grant us all the hope, joy, and peace we find through trusting you as we pray together the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so, my friends, as we end our time of worship, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Return no one evil for evil. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. May God's peace be with you. Alleluia. Amen.